he was uh, convinced by members of the uh, Republicans in Hillsborough County to draw up what, what are known as the Hillsborough Resolves, which stated the pro aspects of the war for Mr. Madison. Following that summer, he studied for the bar and presented himself at Hopkinton, New Hampshire in September where he was duly admitted. Now, in 1812, he started his own law practice. He practiced out of his, his parents' home where he was also living and he did extremely well in the law, made a lot of money, made a lot of contacts. He became a member of the school inspections committee. He became a selectman in Francistown. He was named a justice of the peace, which is a much, which is a much more prominent position then in it, as it, then uh, than it is now. And he also became very active in Republican politics. He served on the Hillsborough County uh, Committee, and he uh, was serving in the wilderness, so to speak, because in 1813. The Republicans who had held office in New Hampshire since about 1805 were swept out of office by the Federalists as a very anti-war measure. The Republicans did not get back into power until 1816. And when 1816 came, Levi Woodbury uh, had himself appointed as clerk of the New Hampshire State Senate. He boarded in the state capitol Concord at the home of Isaac Hill, and one of the other boarders happened to be William Plummer, who was governor of the, governor of the state. And as a result, uh, Woodbury became very close to Plummer, was actually appointed as the uh, adjutant, military adjutant for the state and was named an honorary colonel. But there was more going on in 1816 than just that. One of the things that had happened in 1813 was that the Federalists, upon gaining power, disestablished every court in the state. And after the courts were disestablished, they created new ones, and only Federalist judges were appointed to hold the positions at, as judges in the courts. As, and that did not sit well with Republicans, and it so happened that the sheriffs were pretty much Republican, and they were refusing to aid the courts. They're refusing to aid the courts and um, images. Oh, images. images. Yes, we haven't gotten to the images yet. We will. Uh, in any event, the sheriffs were supporting the old courts and as a result there was a major tussle and the legislature decided that they would eliminate all the sheriffs legislatively and that killed the opposition to the old Republican courts. Now, when 1816 came along, there were two major developments, and one of them was the disestablishment of all the Federalist courts. They were wiped clean, and this time the Republican legislators not only disestablished the courts, but they, uh, they abolished the judgeships which they had been held. Even the Federalists hadn't done that. Technically, the, the, Fed, the Republicans who had been on the court were still judges. In 1816, the legislation wiped them out. However, William Plummer, who had been a Federalist in the old days, wanted to be bipartisan. And what he did was attempt to, to appoint some Federalist judges. The highest court in New Hampshire at that time was the Superior Court. It was called the Superior Court. There are three members. And he nominated two Republicans and he wanted a third to be a Federalist. And he offered it to Jeremiah Mason, a resident of Portsmouth, an ardent Federalist, a former United States Senator, and he couldn't get it through his executive council. We have an executive council here in New Hampshire which has to approve all appointments. He, um, he then went and uh, spoke to a man named Upham, George Upham, who was also a Federalist, to see if he would take the job, and Upham said he would. And Plummer used a a great deal of political capital and got Upham through the executive council. And then Upham said, gee whiz, I don't want it. That was, that was rather frustrating to Plummer. And he, uh, he again went back to Mason to see if Mason might want to try again. He told Mason, I think I can get you through, but Mason said, no, I don't want it. And finally, 
Plummer went to a gentleman named Harris and Harris was nominated and appointed and confirmed by the executive council. After he was confirmed, Harris said, I don't want it. Now added to that was one of the judges of the common pleas who had, who had been appointed, took his commission and tacked it on a saloon door. That didn't go down well with Plummer either. Plummer was becoming, uh, well, whatever governors get when that type of thing happens. So one night he looked over at his 26 year old boarder, Woodbury, Le Woodbury Le Levi, excuse me, Levi Woodbury, and asked if he would like to be a judge. And I'm sure Woodbury said, sure, I'd love to be. So Plummer appointed Levi Woodbury to the Superior Court at the age of 26. He was finally confirmed at the age of 27. And he sat for a good number of years. And I'm not going to get into what he did on the bench, although it's a fascinating story. Uh, this is concentrating on politics. So perhaps the, uh, the most political thing that happened during his tenure on the court was the Dartmouth College case. Uh, president of Dartmouth College in 1850 was a gentleman named John Wheelock. And he was actually the son of the first president, Dartmouth having been formed in 1769. He was having trouble, Mr. Wheelock was, with his board of directors. And the trouble resulted in his being fired. And when he was fired, he asked the legislature to investigate Dartmouth, which was generally known in New Hampshire as a haven for Federalists and a Federalist nest of vipers. Well, Mr. Wheelock, or President Wheelock, got his wish and the Republicans investigated. And one of the things they determined to do was pack the board of trustees. They made Dartmouth essentially a state university. They created nine more trustees and they created a board of overseers, the board of overseers having the right to revoke or change any particular decision of the trustees. One of the trustees was Levi Woodbury. And the new trustees attempted to organize and have meetings, but they were thwarted at every turn by the old trustees who who still composed uh, a goodly number of them. They were known as the octagon, those opposing, the eight opposing the, um, the state mandates. And finally, the, uh, the octagon, octagon chose to take their case to the New Hampshire courts arguing that what the legislature had done impaired contracts, the contract created in 1769 when Dartmouth got its charter. The, uh, one of the reasons that people think that all the Federalists might have said no to being appointed judges was they wanted to show that New Hampshire had no place for Federalists, that they couldn't get fair treatment, and they would have to go to the federal courts in order to get that treatment. Well, the state courts in New Hampshire actually did uh, rule against Dartmouth College or the old Dartmouth and said that there was no impairment of contracts. When that happened, uh, it went to the United States Supreme Court and you had J uh, Jeremiah Mason, Daniel Webster and Jeremiah Smith all appearing for the old Dartmouth College arguing to Chief Justice Marshall in the Supreme Court that there was no justice for Federalists in New Hampshire, that New Hampshire had impaired that contract and it should be found unconstitutional. That's also the case where Daniel Webster was, was heard to say before the Supreme Court, it's a small college, but there are those of us who love it. In any event, one of the interesting things politically during that fight was when the case be came before the New Hampshire, uh, New Hampshire Superior Court, and Levi Woodbury was a former trustee. He had resigned by that point. And an interesting historical question is, did Levi Woodbury sit on the Dartmouth College case when he was on the Superior Court? There's conflicting evidence on that. 
And when the case was initially reported in volume one of the New Hampshire reports, there was no mention of Woodbury not sitting, and that's an indication he did sit. Further, you have a letter which Levi Woodbury wrote to Governor Plummer basically saying, as to Webster, we have had more, uh, more language than light. So that's another indication he would seem to have sat on the case, which in today's uh, era would not be acceptable since uh, a judge who had been a, a trustee so recently would be automatically disqualified from hearing a case. But you have to remember, judicial ethics really didn't get a foothold until 1890. So there is more evidence that he didn't sit. 50 years later, the uh, in the New Hampshire reports, the case of Dartmouth College was reprinted. And in the reprinting, there is an indication that Justice Woodbury doth not sit. And the question is, did he or not? There's evidence on both sides. The, um, the other case I want to mention from a political standpoint on Dartmouth College and Woodbury is a case of Merrill versus Sherburne. And that is a case where the New Hampshire legislature granted a new trial to a disappointed litigant. Again, that's not something you see in today's world, but it was very common back then. This gentleman had lost a case in the Superior Court and the legislature granted him a new trial even though a, uh, his various uh, judicial remedies had been exhausted. Woodbury said that that was unconstitutional, that the general court, the legislature had no right to do that. And as a result of uh, of that, he ruled the statute was unconstitutional. Back in 1975, I wrote a paper on Levi Woodbury and it concentrated on the judicial aspects of his career. And when I wrote about Merrill versus Sherburn, I indicated it was an act of judicial courage for a young judge to go up against the legislature and tell them that they had acted unconstitutionally. Well, uh, it shows that you're always in a position to learn. A number of years ago, I went to a lecture by John Reed, who's a noted New Hampshire legal historian. And during the course of the lecture, he was referring to a letter that William Plummer Jr. had written to his father, Governor William Plummer. And in that letter, Plummer Jr. indicated that the legislature had wanted to get rid of all these dissatisfied litigants who were asking for new trials. And Woodbury had finally come up with a solution to do it. So it would appear that the act of judicial courage, I thought, occurred in Merrill versus Sherman was more of, I don't even want to use the word pandering, but I guess it would be pandering to the legislature. The, um, the, judicial career of Levi Woodbury ended in 1823. Now what happened is Isaac Hill, who was a power in the National Republican Party, held a convention which nominated a gentleman named Samuel Dinsmore as governor of New Hampshire. Nobody liked Dinsmore, apparently except Isaac Hill. And people came to Woodbury and literally begged him to run for governor. He, um, he took the, uh, the requests very seriously and he did run for governor while he was still on the bench. That wasn't a bad thing in those days. And with the help of Federalists and uh, anti-Hill people and people who didn't like Dinsmore, he was elected as governor of New Hampshire. Uh, by the way, in Portsmouth, he got 900 votes to less than 50 for Dinsmore. He was very popular in Portsmouth, which was his new home and which we will get to in momentarily. In any event, when, uh, when Dinsmore lost and Woodbury became governor, he unfortunately acted more like a judge than he did a politician. He was too nice to the various factions. He tried to be 
fair to everybody. And as any politician knows, when you try that, you make significant groups unhappy. And that is just what Woodbury did. He antagonized just about everyone, even Isaac Hill, who had done nothing but lip service and who had done very well in terms of appointments. So the term of a governor in 1823 was one year. So in June of 1824, Woodbury was out of a job and he had to go home. Now, I do have some illustrations and I'm going to ask Nicole if she can put up number one. I will go back and come forward a little bit. And what we're seeing, we're actually going back to Woodbury's childhood home. As you can see, uh, his family wasn't really poor dirt, poor dirt farmers. They had some money. And his house, that house, which is his parents, sits right on Francistown Green to this day. And that's a photograph I took about 10 years ago. It's a beautiful house. And we want to bring, bring ourselves forward, however, to uh, Woodbury's domestic situation in 1820. Two. So if we can have the next one, Nicole, the next illustration, two. Well, can we have number two, Nicole? Um, we might be having some technical difficulties. Can we have the next one, Nicole? Well, you know, we are having some technical difficulties, which is common enough in today's world. Well, in any event, Woodbury lived in Francistown until 1818. And in 1818, he met a girl, and her name was Elizabeth Clapp, C-L-A-P-P. -P. Ah, there she is. There's Elizabeth Clapp. And her father was, she disappeared. Um, in any event, Elizabeth was the daughter of an extremely wealthy Portland merchant. And it's unclear how they met. It's speculated that in fact, they did meet in Portsmouth. There's Elizabeth again. She was a very attractive woman, a very outgoing person and became a, um, a favorite hostess when they get to Washington, which you'll hear about shortly. And she had many suitors, but on June 14th, 1819, Woodbury married Elizabeth and they moved in to a house in Portsmouth, which was the Captain Samuel Ham house. And it was a wedding present that her father gave to Elizabeth. Now, dad was very smart in this regard because uh, he certainly didn't want his daughter to not have the thing of value he gave her, i.e. the house. So the house was never in Woodbury's name, it was always in Elizabeth and she died well after he did. Can we have the next slide? Ah, there he is. That's Elizabeth's father, Asa Clapp, who was uh, not only a very, um, not only was he a very prominent merchant, a wealthy merchant, he also funded many of Levi's political endeavors. And he bought the house, the Captain Samuel house. Can we have the next one? Nicole. Ah, there we go. The Elms. That was the mansion known as the Woodbury Mansion. It was up on Woodbury Avenue at the very end. The Portsmouth Housing Authority has uh, units up there at the present time. And we lost it again. Um, I think we're gonna try and get it back. But what I wanna tell you about the Elms is that, there it is. The house was built in 1810 by Captain Samuel Ham. He didn't let it let on that he was extremely broke. And when he finished the house, he gave a heck of a party. And after everybody had a very good time and was leaving, he went upstairs and hung himself. Now, I am speculating since Franklin Pierce 
moved into the Woodbury House in 1824 in order to be a law clerk. And since the um, one of the best buddies, if not the best friend of Franklin Pierce was Nathaniel Hawthorne, I believe that Hawthorne may well have heard the story of Ham and used it in the opening of the House of Seven Gables. In the House of Seven Gables, Colonel Pinchian lusts after Maul's land. He accuses Maul of witchcraft. Maul is executed. Pinchian gets the land. He builds a beautiful house. He gives a party. And when the party is over, he is found dead in his chair with blood coming from his mouth. Now, I have asked um, three biographers of of uh, Hawthorne, whether or not they have seen anything in his notebooks, which might give some uh, credibility to that speculation. Two of them wrote me back and they said there was nothing in the, um, there was nothing in, the, in his notebooks or anything of that type, but certainly it was interesting speculation. Can I have the next, please, next slide. That is the Woodbury Mansion about 1935. It was, uh, Broadly, it was very prominently featured in uh, John Mead Howell's Architectural History of the Piscataqua. And it was starting to get somewhat seedy there, but not totally. Uh, can we have the next slide too, please, after this? Yeah. Uh, by the mid-1950s, it had really become decrepit, and there were many more trees in front, and it really did look like something out of dark shadows. When Strawberry Bank was being formed, it was hoped that the building could be moved to Strawberry Bank. However, for those of you familiar with Portsmouth, right at the bottom of Bartlett Street, which is where Woodbury Avenue comes out, there is a narrow and low railroad trestle, and there was no way that they could get that house underneath. And unfortunately, it was demolished in 1960, although somebody recently told me in 1961. But in any event, it is it was demolished, and it most unfortunate that that happened. I'd like to um, go to the next slide, please, if I could. And mm, well, I these are a little bit out of order, but I will go with it. Um, this is Woodbury's daughter, Elizabeth Blair. And Elizabeth Woodbury Blair, and uh, she married Montgomery Blair, who was postmaster general under Abraham Lincoln, and uh, they had the Blair House, which today is a, uh, a, a residence for dignitaries, and it's where Harry Truman stayed when the White House was under construction in 1948. Uh, Montgomery Blair was the son of Frank, uh, Francis Preston Blair, who was a, a crony of Andrew Jackson's. Uh, and she was a middle child, if I'm not mistaken. And may I have the next slide? That's Charles Levi Woodbury. Charles Levi Woodbury was Levi's oldest son. He was born in 1820. He became a very prominent lawyer in Boston. And he... Um, uh, well, I will say this, that in the 1840s, uh, Charles Levi Woodbury was representing Samuel Colt in a very important patent suit, and it was tried before the circuit court in Boston, and it just so happened that the judge in the case was Levi Woodbury. Again, not something we would see in today's world, but back then, um, if you didn't have a direct, direct, direct interest in matters, you weren't disqualified apparently. And uh, may I have the next slide please? That is Ellen Woodbury and she is Levi Woodbury's youngest daughter. She never married, the only one who didn't marry. And she moved to, uh, she lived outside of Washington. That's where she died. And next one please. Ah, this is the one that I wanted to show you earlier. This is Levi Woodbury and he, at this point in time, is, he's governor, I believe. Unfortunately, when you go on and you try and get uh, photographs and portraits of Levi Woodbury, they aren't marked as far as dates. 
but I believe this is the one which may well be hanging in either the Supreme Court building in Concord or uh, the State House. So let me go on about Levi Woodbury. We, he had just lost the 1824 election. He was a private citizen. He went back to practice law. Franklin Pierce, who was the son of a very good friend, uh, General Benjamin Pierce, a hero of Bunker Hill, uh, was his law clerk and was his law clerk for 14 months. Woodbury was not home, however, thinking about practicing law for the rest of his life. It so happened that uh, John Parrott's term in the Senate was up in 1825 and the legislature was seriously voting on who would succeed him. Back in the 1820s, it was the House and Senate of the various states that elected the senators, not, it was not popular vote. Jeremiah Mason, um, one of uh, Woodbury's old adversaries, was the prime candidate for Senate and he was very popular in the House of Representatives, but there were 12 members in the Senate and he just could not get a majority. And there was a lengthy fight in the summer of 1824. They put it off to the fall of 1824 when the legislature reconvened. And then seven senators committed to vote for Jeremiah Mason. And it appeared that he was in as United States Senator the following year. Well, something strange happened. One of the seven senators, a gentleman named Nehemiah Eastman, uh, withdrew his support of Mason. So it was now six to six. It just so happened that Nehemiah Mason was the brother-in-law of Levi Woodbury. So we have to wonder if perhaps Nehemiah Mason was, was uh, interested in seeing his brother-in-law go forward to the Senate, which he did. In the spring of 1824, Levi Woodbury decided to run for the New Hampshire House of Representatives. And when he showed up, he was immediately made Speaker of the House of Representatives. But he didn't stay there long because the legislature at that time decided that Levi Woodbury was their man and he was chosen to become a United States Senator. And he arrived in 1825 in the Capitol. Not too long after arriving in the Capitol, he by the way, when he went to Washington, everybody assumed that he was a John Quincy Adams man, just like all the prominent politicians in New Hampshire were. So shortly after he arrived in Washington, he gave a speech involving tariff issues and the presiding officer of the United States Senate, Senator John C. Calhoun, uh, uh, noticed Levi and two or three days later invited him and Elizabeth to dine with he and Floride, which they did. And they became extremely close friends, even exchanging correspondence about visiting each other. And uh, I would also say that John C. Calhoun was also a student at uh, Tapping Reeve Law School. In any event, Woodbury, in addition to making friends with John C. Calhoun, made friends with Martin Van Buren. He became a very close friend of Martin Van Buren. So in 1826, John Quincy Adams, uh, I should say, John Quincy Adams got elected in 1824 as a result of a corrupt bargain, or so say Jackson supporters back then, where he promised John, uh, excuse me, Henry Clay that he would become Secretary of State if in fact he supported John Quincy Adams and Clay did support Adams and Clay became Secretary of State. In 1826, Simone Bolivar called a Pan America conference, uh, Pan American conference in Panama and the United States was invited. John Quincy Adams uh, wasn't too keen on it, but Henry Clay talked him into sending a delegation. John Quincy Adams decided that he would ask the approval of the Senate in order to send delegates. Big mistake. There were a number of senators who got up and spoke and indicated why we should not send representatives to Panama. 
One of those was Levi Woodbury, who tweaked Quincy Adams's nose, so to speak, and it was a very surprising thing for him to do. But it also indicated a move by Woodbury from Adams' camp to Jackson's camp. And politically, uh, Woodbury's ideas were probably closer to the common man, common man thoughts of Jackson than they were to the elitism of Quincy Adams. In 1827, uh, Woodbury was definitely a supporter of Andrew Jackson, and he um, there was a tariff being debated at that time called the Tariff of 1828 or the Tariff of Abominations. The Tariff of Abominations was very, very strongly opposed by the South, including John C. Calhoun and Robert Hayne and others. However, Andrew Jackson was in favor of that tariff because he thought it would help shore up his support in the mid-Atlantic region. Jackson already knew that as far as winning over Quincy Adams in the South, there was no question, tariff or not. Levi Woodbury gave a very strong speech uh, for the tariff of 1828. That, was, that did not go over well with the home crowd. Plummer and others in New Hampshire were shocked and dismayed that he did it. But he did, and he did it, there's very little doubt, he did it to curry favor with Jackson. In 1829, um, well, I'll go back one step. After Jackson was elected in 1828, Woodbury thought that he would get a cabinet appointment or something high up in the government. When he arrived in Washington at the end of 1828, he was, he was shocked that Jackson had put together a cabinet and Woodbury's name had not been mentioned. He, uh, uncharacteristically, he went to uh, Martin Van Buren's home and banged on the door after uh, Van Buren had gone to sleep and bitterly complained about not having received anything. Van Buren said, well, let me see what I can do. And you have to understand, New Hampshire had not gone for Jackson, so that probably is one reason why Woodbury didn't get in the cabinet. But in any event, Van Buren, being a friend, said that it was within his, within his power as Secretary of State to give him a mission, uh, the mission to Spain. And he cleared that with Andrew Jackson, and Andrew Jackson said, fine. And Van Buren said to Levi Woodbury, you can be minister to Spain. Woodbury thought about it, but wife Elizabeth said, no way. I'm not going to Spain, a Catholic country, backward as far as she was concerned. So he didn't take the position, and it would it appeared that Woodbury was going to soon give up his Senate seat because back in those days in New Hampshire there was no returning senators to office. You got one shot at it, and that was it. No rotation. There was complete rotation in office. So he knew that he was not going to go back to the Senate. And um, but, he, but two things happened. Number one. Uh, Levi Woodbury actually started the Bank War, and uh, the Bank War was a significant event in the early 1830s, but Woodbury wrote a scathing letter to uh, the Secretary of the Treasury as well as Nicholas Biddle about the performance of their Portsmouth manager, Jeremiah Mason. He said that Jeremiah Mason was acting politically. He wouldn't give loans to anybody but Federalists and Federalist-like minded people, and he wanted to investigate it. Well, uh, Nicholas Biddle came up to New Hampshire and he found no problem. So nothing happened then. Then we have in 1830, as the time for Woodbury to go home is getting closer, we have the famous debate on the foot resolution or often thought of as the Hayne Webster debate and that's where, in response to Hain talking about nullification because of the unfair treatment it was receiving on the tariff, uh, Webster said, uh, union now and forever, one and inseparable. And Woodbury participated in that debate. 
And he came down very strongly on the side of states' rights. Again, something that Jackson was very much in favor of. And as a result of that speech, Thomas Hart Benton, who was a fellow senator from Missouri and one of the leading Democrats in the country, uh, came up to Woodbury, put his hand on his shoulder and said, thou art Peter and upon this rock will be built the democracy of New England and hell shall not prevail against it. And uh, after that, Woodbury became known as uh, the rock of New England democracy. But again, he was looking for a job, he didn't have one and he was getting ready to pack his bags when fortuitously the Peggy Eaton affair erupted. Now, John Eaton was an old army buddy of Andrew Jackson. And when Jackson had put his cabinet together, he picked Eaton as his secretary of war. Eaton, not too long before assuming that position, had married Peggy O'Neill. She was a, um, a widower at that point, and excuse me, a widow, but she had been a barmaid and she became, she was looked upon as having a very low social status. Being in a bar with men without women or a chaperone was just not something that was acceptable in those days to people who were of uh, social, uh, who had social standing. And as a result, the wives of the cabinet members, uh, led by Floride Calhoun, who was vice president's wife, they, uh, they wouldn't receive Peggy, and not only wouldn't they receive her, but uh, they wouldn't go to her house, and uh, it was very uncomfortable for Peggy and John. Well, Jackson was furious because he had been through the situation with his wife, Rachel. He loved Rachel, they got married, and then they found out afterwards that the divorce really hadn't gone through, so he was a bigamist. And Rachel and he went through all types of social ostracism as a result of that. And uh, Rachel had actually died right before Jackson was inaugurated. Well, Jackson's solution was to fire his entire cabinet. He even uh, accepted Martin Van Buren's resignation. So Jackson appointed at that, at that time, he appointed Levi Woodbury as Secretary of the Navy. So Woodbury now had a job and he would be serving with Jackson. And by the way, uh, after, after Martin Van Buren was resigned as Secretary of State, he was offered a position of Minister to England. And there was a tie vote in the Senate as to whether his appointment would be approved. And John C. Calhoun voted against him. So Van Buren didn't get to be minister to England. He waited a few months, however, and he ended up as Andrew Jackson's nominee for vice president. The bank war doesn't end there. Uh, the United States Bank was supposed to, its, its charter terminated in 1836. Nicholas Biddle believed that Henry Clay had a really good chance of beating Andrew Jackson in 1832, so he asked Congress to, to renew the charter in 1832. Jackson was furious, and uh, he basically, uh, he, he wouldn't accept the, uh, Congress actually passed the law, and then Jackson vetoed the bill, and it was a major campaign issue in 1832. Uh, Woodbury, by the way, helped Jackson on his veto message. And um, after the 1832 election, when Jackson won, he wanted revenge against Nicholas Biddle. So he brought it up to his cabinet about removing all federal money from the Bank of the United States, even though there was still four years to go on its charter. Well, his secretary of the treasury said, oh, that's a bad idea. I really don't think we should do it. So Jackson uh, pushed him over to another cabinet post. And since the majority of the cabinet was saying, let's remove the money, Jackson ordered the secretary of the treasury to take the money out of the Bank of the United States. And Duane, who was secretary of the treasury said no, and Jackson fired him. He needed a secretary of treasury. Congress was not in session. So he gave an interim appointment as secretary of the treasury to Roger Taney. 
Rajatani did just what Jackson told him to do. He took all the money out. Since Jackson uh, had appointed Tawney on an interim basis, he then had to submit Tawney to the Senate for confirmation. And the Senate would not confirm Tawney as Secretary of the Treasury. So Jackson went to one of the most respected senators, really. Levi Woodbury had a great deal of respect in the Senate. He, he was a cautious man. He was very, um, he, he didn't, he wasn't flamboyant. He made friends with everybody. The fact that he could keep Martin Van Buren and John C. Calhoun as best friends uh, was an amazing feat in terms of his ability to, to uh, curry friendship. So in any event, Levi Woodbury was appointed Secretary of the Treasury by Jackson, and he was easily confirmed in that position. He served as Secretary of Treasury during the remainder of Jackson's return, uh, term, and then went on to serve under Martin Van Buren. Uh, Biddle did all kinds of nasty things to contract the economy like bankers can do if they want. And another thing was the, um, they made it very difficult to, to get specie. That became very rare. And as a result of all the economic chaos, much of it surrounding the Bank of the United States, there was a panic in 1837, a depression, while Levi Woodbury was Secretary of the Treasury. And um, we, we have, uh, it was interesting when we examined records in the Portsmouth Athenaeum that the, uh, there was a, a destruction of one of the busts in the Portsmouth Athenaeum. Didn't say who it was, but a couple of meetings later, there was a request of so many dollars to purchase a bust of Levi Woodbury. So we can assume that somebody didn't like Levi Woodbury enough to smash his bust. So... Woodbury uh, did his best, and he even ended up, the Treasury put him on the $1 documentary stamp, and he was there until, I think it was 1959, when the federal government did away with its ability, well, took, decided not to collect money on deeds. But if you look at any deed before 1960, and you find a dollar stamp on it, and that's a very common denomination, you will see Le Levi Woodbury there. So in... Um, 1841, William Henry Harrison wins, and uh, Woodbury goes home for a very short period of time, but then they need a senator again from New Hampshire, and Woodbury is elected. There's not, there wasn't a problem with rotation if there's a, a term or two between you when you were in the Senate. So he went back, and in, um, in 1844, his name was bandied about for president. He, he had support at the convention of the Democrats. Polk was elected and Polk uh, got the opportunity to make a Supreme Court appointment. It, by the way, you'll, you can guess it was Woodbury, but what's kind of interesting about it is that the seat that came open was a seat of Joseph Story. Story had been a United States Supreme Court justice since 1808. He and John Marshall were of a like mind and their cases during the early 19th century uh, paved the way for a, a national outlook on legislation and on goals as opposed to state rights. After Marshall died in 1835, Story was kind of discouraged and he really wanted to leave the bench. However, in 1835, he was facing Jackson as president and then Van Buren, both of whom were strict constructionists who would not appoint someone who Story believed was appropriate. And then when William Henry Harrison was elected, he died after a month and John Tyler came in as president and Tyler was, was a Democrat and was very likely to appoint somebody favorable to states' rights. So Story was doing his best to hang on. Well, in 1845, he just couldn't hold on anymore and he died. So there was a need to fill his spot on the Supreme Court. And in those days, the justices of the Supreme Court did circuits. So in other words, it wasn't just sitting in Washington. They had to go out and hear cases all over their district. And that's why you needed somebody from the same district uh, from the district that they lived in so they wouldn't have to go from 
New England to Florida or wherever. So Story Circuit was New England and that's where Woodbury became a circuit judge on uh, as well as United States Supreme Court Justice. It was an interim appointment because Congress was not in session back when he was initially commissioned. However, uh, when Congress came back into uh, session in January of 1846, he was immediately confirmed, I believe unanimously, no problems at all. I don't even think there were hearings back in those days. So um, while, even though Woodbury was a judge, his real love was politics and he really wanted to be president. As I said, in 1844, there was a little bit of a boomlet. But come 1848, he went into the convention with actually the third highest number of delegates. And as it was, uh, Lewis Cass, who was born in New Hampshire, by the way, but was a senator from Michigan, got the Democratic nomination in 1848. Well, it was probably good for Woodbury that he didn't get the nomination in 1848 because uh, the Whigs chose Zachary Taylor, a war hero, and uh, uh, Taylor w w ran, uh, walked into the White House, or I should say rode into the White House on his charger, and his vice president was a, pretty much a non-entity, and Mill Millard Fillmore was his name. So the Democrats were, were beaten, and they had to wait until... Uh, oh, another reason the Democrats didn't do well in 1848 was Martin Van Buren ran on a third party ticket known as the Liberty Party, which the goal of which was to limit the expansion of slavery into the territories. So during this period, there's one case I'll mention uh, on politics, and that was uh, Luther versus Borden. There was a, uh, in, in 1844 or so, in Rhode Island, there was, the Constitution was a charter granted in 1664, and it did not have universal suffrage, suffrage for men. So there was a little bit of a, a rebellion, not much. The only thing that happened is um, the leader, a guy named Dorr, tried to take over an armory. He was quickly subdued. Nothing else happened of a violent nature. But a... Um, there was a citizen whose home was invaded and he sued saying that the invasion, the government which passed the law authorizing it was not a valid government and that the government regardless did not have the power to invoke martial law, which it did. So the Supreme Court basically said this is a political issue. We don't want to get involved in it. But while Woodbury agreed with the position it was a political issue as to who was the proper government, he was appalled by the in invocation of martial law. And he wrote a long decision on the issue of martial law, how even General Gage in Boston, when they were under attack by Washington's army, hadn't invoked uh, martial law, how a, a British rebel in the 16th, 15th century had um, been executed under a martial law edict and how his executioners had been executed themselves for violating the law by, by undertaking martial law. So this was an effort by Woodbury, in, in my opinion, to gain national attention on an issue where he would have been on the right side, the side of the people here. So he was thinking of the presidency. He was working on the presidency. He was contacting people. And as 1851 approached, he had already had conversations and I should say he had had correspondence with Martin Van Buren and Martin Van Buren was going to support him. Thomas Hart Benton, who was a very prominent Midwestern Democrat, was going to support him. There was really nobody else. Zachary Taylor by that point had died, some say by eating a bowl of cherries. Fillmore wasn't going to get the nomination and Clay was getting old, uh, would die within a few years. And there were, uh, James Buchanan maybe might have been a threat to Woodbury, but all in all, Woodbury was well positioned to become the Democratic nominee and be elected president. He died in 1851. He, he didn't have stomach cancer too long. I believe he didn't feel well in July, and by September 4th, he was dead. 
but he was um, he was a, a very uh, prominent man of his time. He was very much a constitutionalist. He he had support in the South. I'll bring this up. He had decided in the Supreme Court the Van Zant case, which gave him notoriety, which upheld the Fugitive Slave Law of 1793. Uh, Woodbury didn't believe in slavery himself, but he didn't consider the Constitution a dirty rag like William Lloyd Garrison did, and he believed that through uh, through time that slavery would wither and that uh, uh, slaves would, uh, I, it, it seems as though he believed in recolonization as well. But in any event, uh, slavery was certainly not something that he, uh, he supported, but it's certainly not anything that he felt he could do anything about since the constitution and the country had been founded on individual states having the right to have slaves should they wish. So I could go on about Levi Woodbury, but at this point, oh, I haven't shown you all the photographs that I have available. And um, I would like to go through these so that you can see some more pictures. This, um, I believe this painting of Woodbury was while he was in the Senate the first term. Again, there was no date on it, so it was hard to do that. Uh, if we can go to 12, please. This is the signature of Levi Woodbury. Very tight. I, I'm not much of a, a reader, so I'm not sure I can tell you what, what it means within its contours. Uh, 13, please. We know this is uh, Woodbury while he was Secretary of the Treasury, which would have been in 1834 uh, to 41, because that is the engraving which shows on the stamp that I mentioned earlier. And the next, uh, we believe that this is probably while he was Secretary of the Navy. If we could go to the next one, please. And this one also could be the Secretary of the Navy, maybe a little bit later, however, it could be Secretary of the Treasury. Next one, please. This is a silhouette. We actually have this silhouette of Woodbury at the Portsmouth Athenaeum. It's, uh, I'm almost positive it's while he was in the United States Senate. And obviously it's a silhouette which was done before the United States Senate had put in a gym. Uh, next, um, next one, please. This is a daguerreotype of Woodbury. And uh, I, I think it shows a kind face there. I think it shows an intelligent face. It's hard to look at the face and determine what's behind there, but he does seem to have a, an empathy about him. Which brings us to the next photograph. Uh, this is while he is on the United States Supreme Court, an engraving. If I can have the next one. Now this one is also on the United States Supreme Court, and this shows him in a little more of a, um, I won't say gruff demeanor, but it's a, a more serious demeanor than the other softer picture of him being on the Supreme Court. And we, if I can have the next one, please. The, um, this is Woodbury's gravesite in Harmony Grove Cemetery here in Portsmouth. And it probably is the highest monument in the cemetery. As I said, he died in 18, 1851, and there were many eulogies and uh, there was national mourning for him. And if I can have the next, uh, please, the next photograph. Jack, that's the last one. Oh, you don't have the other one? That's all they I have. She was supposed to show you a drawing? Um, nope, I had 20 images and that's them. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> well, okay. Well, I was going to show you the, um, as I said, when I was in law school, I did a paper on, on Woodbury and my wife, who was a fairly accomplished artist, uh, drew a, a, a sketch of Woodbury, which uh, 
uh, I used his front cover, and which was very impressive to my professor, who who said that it definitely made the uh, the the A which he gave me for it. So. <laughs> So that is pretty much it on Levi Woodbury. And as long as your questions aren't too hard, I certainly have no objection to uh, seeing what I can do to answer some or all of them. And thank you. So there were two questions um, that were sent to me in a private message um, from Shauna. Uh, and the first was, was the uh, disestablishment of the courts legal? This was, I think, referring to the beginning of your talk. Right, in 1813 uh, and then in 1816. Well, there were many people at the time who said it was unconstitutional. And uh, since then, there has been an amendment to the uh, New Hampshire Constitution, which would prevent this type of thing from happening again. Uh, it actually did happen a couple of more times. Um, but, but now it would be unconstitutional. Then many people said it was unconstitutional, but the legislature still did it. Yes. Okay, and Shauna had a second question that said, uh, considering Gover Governor Plummer's insistent commitment to nonpartisanship, do you, see, uh, do you, Jack, see any analogous figures among contemporary governors and or politicians? Well, the way I came to look at Woodbury is this. He had the fair-mindedness and the open-mindedness and the intellect to be a very good judge. His opinions were extremely well-written, if lengthy, and he showed an ability to see all sides and to fairly attempt to uh, treat people as fairly as possible. And frankly, that's probably not the best description of a politician. Politicians have to take quick, decisive action, oftentimes against the interest of friends or former colleagues. And I, uh, I certainly, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't want to get into the current presidential race and, and give any opinions on that. Um, I, I, well, no, I, I, if I thought about it, Shauna, I could probably think of somebody who would meet those qualifications. And the next time I see or talk to you, I will try and think of somebody. Okay, there is a question, um, actually a comment from Tom Hardiman at the mm -hmm. Athenaeum. Jack, yeah. fun fact, Elizabeth Clapp's father, a uh, Asa Clapp, was a native of Portsmouth. I did not know that. I thought he lived up in Portland all his life. So thank you, Tom. I, I can say um, there's a building, well, there's a building named, up, named after him up in, Port, in Portland now. And uh, he, uh, I, you always learn something. As I said, when I went to John Reed's lecture, I learned that, uh, uh, that Woodbury was not displaying bold judicial courage when he, found Merrill versus Sherburn unconstitutional, or when he found the, the new trial unconstitutional in that case. So thank you. Okay, I don't see any other questions. Anyone else have any questions? I think what I'm gonna do is unmute everybody and see, see how that goes. If anyone has a question, they can speak up. Sure. Absolutely. Okay, everyone, there you go. Where is Harmony Grove Cemetery? It is between South Street and Sagamore. If, um, if you were, is this Devin? Yes. Do I recognize voice? Um, <laughs> you, <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You, um, if you go down, if you, if you go down South Street from the South End, if, you, if you're at the fish market and you head out South Street and you get to the Harmony Grove Cemetery, it's the cemetery on the left, just before you get the lights at Sagamore, there's a gate there. You take that gate and you go pretty much straight for probably uh, at least a half a mile and you can't miss it, it's right there, it's right on that road. So we know it as the South Cemetery. Yes, the South Cemetery, 
actually consists of five cemeteries. And Sagamore, uh, Harmony Grove is one of them. So yes, yeah, it, I, it's generally known as the South Cemetery, yes. I've walked it many times and I know you can walk, oh, I'm a half a mile at least in one direction because it's very large. Right, it is, very large cemetery, yep. So. Yeah. Hi, Jack. Hi, Karen. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm good. Good. Listen, I really enjoyed this. Do you by any chance have the drawing handy? Because if you do, you can, that you reference, you can just hold it up in front of your screen. Oh, oh. I told you I was technologically challenged. <laughs> <laughs> you just want to see Diane's drawings, what you want to do. Yes. Do. Yes. Okay. All right. Oh, let's see what I'm here. Yeah. No. Touch it. No. Nope. It goes away. Nope. Yep. Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. Can you see good. that now? I All did. Right, yes. For a minute. Yes. Yeah, leave that over at the top, and then yeah. She did a good job. Yeah. Nice job, yes. doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you all of you for coming. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Thank Jack. You. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Okay. <laughs> thanks, Bye -bye. Jack. It's nice Thank to hear you, everybody's Jack. voices. Nice job. Good job, Jack. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Fact, you look Great a lot like really football yourself. I've, I've even got, I've got people here from Cincinnati I just saw. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hi, Jack. Hi there. Hi, Dave. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Carol. <laughs> Who else? Reading that from the guy, oldest law school. Like was, was that? Oh, no, it's down here. It's Grossman. <laughs> ah, Dick, how are you? I'm doing well. Good, good. But you Any look questions? a little bit like your subject matter. <laughs> it's, it's the jowls. That's what do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. right. Any yeah. questions, though? Okay, everybody, unless there are oh, any other, other questions. One question. Yes. <laughs> yeah, one question. So, Margo had a question about his relationship with John C. Calhoun. Yes. And we're particularly interested in that because we live down here in Georgia, and John C. Calhoun is a big deal in South Carolina and Georgia history. Right, mm. right. So, so his relationship. What can you, his tell, relationship? What can you tell, what can us tell us about their relationship? Well, you know, um, as I said, they right after right after uh, Woodbury made his maiden speech in the Senate, he Calhoun invited him to dinner two or three days later, and I'm talking about a personal dinner, not to go out with the guys, and. I'm sure they talked about their experiences at Tapping Reeve Law School. Um, they, I, I know they didn't go to, I know that well, Woodbury went to Dartmouth, John C. Calhoun went to Yale. Um, Calhoun was very much a state's rights advocate, although early in his career, he was one of those known as a, a war hawk. He really pushed Madison, he and Henry Clay were both pushing Madison toward uh, declaring war against Britain. He, uh, in, in the, for eight years, he was the vice president. He was vice president under John Quincy Adams and he was vice president under Andrew Jackson. He managed to antagonize both of them. And I never saw anything which indicated that Woodbury, um, his personal relationship with Calhoun waned, even when Woodbury supported the Tariff of Abominations in 1828, it doesn't appear to have adversely affected the relationship that Calhoun had with him. I know that in, um, in the 1840s, the uh, Calhoun was actually talking about Woodbury as a potential presidential candidate. Uh, Woodbury, uh, while he wasn't for slavery, he, he was very much 
one of those who said that in those places where it's instituted, you are going to have it. The Constitution says you're going to have it. And I think that uh, Calhoun knew him as a man who would uphold that and gave him some comfort. That's one of the things that Woodbury would have had going for him in 1848 is he could have uh, gotten support from the South because of his position. Uh, one of the things I'll say too, um, Franklin, Franklin Pierce, and this it ties into Woodbury, I, I mean to Calhoun. Franklin Pierce, who, who was elected in 1852, had to face what we call the, uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which was put forward by Stephen Douglas, a very prominent senator from Illinois. And under, under the Kansas-Nebraska Act, there was popular sovereignty as to whether or not slavery would exist in Kansas and Nebraska. Now, in order to do that, Congress had to implicitly repeal the Missouri Compromise. And that was the compromise in 1820, which created Maine, happy 200th, and um, also created Missouri, but the Missouri was to be the only state north of its southern border who would have any, who, which would have slavery at all. And by having Kansas and Nebraska popular sovereignty, it, it, it did away with that compromise. I don't think Woodbury, while Woodbury was willing to support slavery in the South where it existed, he was not of a mind to allow it to expand. And I think he would have been against the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Now, in those volatile times, I don't know what difference it would have made, to be honest with you, whether or not the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed or not, because I think inevitably we were probably headed to the Civil War. But um, I, all I can tell you is they were drinking buddies, if you will. There was a, when Woodbury was in the Senate, he stayed with a Mrs. Payton. And Mrs. Payton had a large boarding house where the Woodburys held forth, and it was called the Woodburys Mess. And Calhoun came to that mess, as did many other uh, Republic, uh, many like other Elfin politicians. House. So, in any event, I, I don't know if that answers the question as much as you wanted, but that's all I can tell you. Uh, yeah, no, that's great. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I have a yep. question. Yes. Uh, okay. What what was uh, uh, what was uh, Woodbury's position? Although he was uh, he died shortly after this. What was his position on the uh, Compromise of 1850 that was engineered by Stephen Douglas and uh, Henry Clay? Well, I do know that in uh, charges which he gave to grand juries, he very much reminded the jurors that they had an obligation to enforce the law even if they didn't like it. And I'm sure that was in response to the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. So I don't know what he thought about the compromise as a whole, but I know that he told grand jurors they had to follow the law. And of course, that was a very unpopular law up here in the North. Uh, and, and so um, it would have been difficult for, for him to, uh, well, it would have been socially difficult for him to say that, but that was his position. He believed in the law and you had to buy it, abide by it and, and you couldn't uh, pick and choose. Mm. So, Tom? Sure. Jack? Yes, Tom. Uh, this is Tom Watson, Jack. Uh, okay. A question for you. Um, after uh, Woodbury headed to Washington as a senator and a cabinet member and on the Supreme Court, did he con still consider Portsmouth to be his home? And uh, after he passed away, did his, his widow return to Portsmouth or move on to other places? I noticed that most, when you were introducing his children, most of them seem to have located in the DC area. Right. Well, that's a good question. Um, he spent a great deal of time in Washington and uh, Elizabeth was known as being one of the most popular hostesses in Washington. After he, uh, he, he did spend a great deal, of, he spent time in Portsmouth. He would come back to Portsmouth. I think he still considered himself a resident of Portsmouth. 
His probate was taken out in Rockingham County. His wife, um, I think she, I've seen references to her being in Washington after his death as being a popular figure. So I, that's a good question. I honestly don't know how much time she would have spent in Washington and how much she would have spent in Portsmouth. Um, her, her father died in 1848, I think. So that might have been one less, and her mother, I believe, was already dead. That would have been one less reason for her to stay up in this area because one of the reasons they chose Portsmouth was she, so she could be closer to her family in Portland and she could take a, a quick little um, boat trip up to Portland. That, that's, uh, I, that's as much as I can tell you, Tom. I, I'm not sure. Do you know how long the house stayed in the family? The um, <clears throat> Elizabeth died in 1873, and Charles Levi Woodbury sold it uh, about 19, about 1900, shortly before his death. I think it was Frank Jones who bought it. So when Frank Jones bought it. It was out of the family. That's 1900, and there were um, uh, there were still a number of personal items show up from time to time. There was an auction of his uh, of Le Charles Levi possession anyway, and they show up every once in a while. And I actually was able to obtain the, um, the uh, like eight shutters from the building. You know, the old pull out shutters, they called them Indian shutters, although by, yeah. you know, by that time they weren't protecting against the Indians. But I, I have those in my basement, figuring out what I should do with them. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Great job, Jack. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank yeah. you. Excellent job. Yeah. If, if there aren't any quest any more questions, I will read through some of the comments in chat for Jack because I know he's not seeing the chat. Um, okay. I think there are some nice messages here that I will relay. Okay. So from Margo, very nice drawing. Tom Hardiman, <laughs> super, Diane, thanks, sir. super job, Jack. Thank you. Um, from Shauna Vey, great drawing, Diane. Margo, <laughs> thanks, Jack. <laughs> you know who has an audience here, okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, from Edward Kaler, my wife worries that politics are a mess today. I tell her to go back to 1805 to 1870, especially 1810 to 1850, and to dig into the late 1830s economic crash. You brought it all. You brought all of this together. Oh, thank you, mm. thank you. Um, Kim writes, "Great job, Jack." Kathy Bursegal, thank you, Jack, for a very good presentation. Uh, Sean of a, uh, Jack Levi was amazing. Never heard of anyone holding so many different prominent offices. Um, Gregory Beck, great. Thanks, Jack. Mary and Eric, good job, Jack. Thank you. Donna W, great job, Jack. Um, and then, let's see, there's a couple more. Kathy, we learned a lot. Great job Zooming. <laughs> um, well, it was help. And then Edward Kaler writes, I wish that I could listen to American history lectures by you anywhere from my college days in the early 1970s, right up to today. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. It sounds like we're contemporaries. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. um, Dave, enjoyed it, Jack. Great job. Lots of great human interest. Hi to die. And your presentation definitely did not violate the rule against per perpetuities. <laughs> you represented the oldest law school in the country well. I want Dave to recite the rule against perpetuities now. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, excellent job, Jack. Your love of the subject matter shines through. That's from Sherry Kerr. And I love historical content of the times. And that's from, let's see, an iPad relating to Karen. Great job from Wendy and Tom Smith. Very interesting, Jack. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you. So, thank you. Jack, on behalf of the Portsmouth Library, thank you so much. Goodbye from Florida. Lovely talk. Thank you, De Devin Joyce. Thank you, Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Thank you everybody.